I would like to introduce you to a church, a church that hardly anybody has heard of, but have had one of the greatest impacts on the planet. Have you ever looked at Islamic mosques? I wanted to know how did they develop that level of architecture? Or what about the human eye? How did modern medical science have a deep intricate knowledge of how the eye works? Well, this knowledge has been handed down to us by a church called the Nestorians. And in this study, I'm going to take you into the past and back into the present and look at a church which kept the biblical Seventh-day creation Sabbath and look at the impact they've had on the modern world. This woman and her distinct East Asian features is a member of the largest ethnic group in the world, the Han Chinese. China has the longest continuous history of any country in the world, with the oldest and most widely continually written and spoken language in the world that the Jesuits called and named Mandarin. What is little known is that China invented paper, gunpowder, tea, the folding umbrella and porcelain and has been able to preserve its culture from any outsiders ransacking its beautifully designed pagodas. People from all over the world are fascinated with the Chinese culture for they have the only known vegetarian beer on the planet called the panda that is kind of on the verge of extinction. The Chinese introduced to the West silk from the silkworm and the silk moth via the famous Silk Road. It has the largest burial of figurines called the terracotta soldiers that the emperor at the time had them carved believed would assist him in the afterlife that is 8,000 figurine soldiers that are buried. China has the biggest ancient architecture, the longest wall in the world that was built to protect the Chinese from outside invaders, the famous Great Wall of China that is around 2,300 years old. It is an architectural wonder that just blows the mind. Though a sort of post-communist country today, China is known for its ancient ancestor worship by introducing Confucianism and Taoism and has impacted the world through its Eastern martial arts via an import into China from India from a monk called Bodhidharma. It is Buddhism which is the foundation of Eastern martial arts. But there is an even older belief in China that precedes them all that are engraved on the symbols of its alphabetic scripts. The Chinese worshipped at one time the one true God who they called the heavenly sovereign Shang Di, the creator of heaven, earth and the universe. And Shang Di is similar to the God of the Bible, El Shaddai. And at the famous temple of heaven in China, from the earliest times, China had a sacrificial system where the emperor would offer a border sacrifice by burning a bullock on the altar to Shang Di on behalf of the nation. And not only does this come from the days of Noah, but some of the earliest Chinese symbols such as create, showing their belief in creation. The flood that destroyed the majority of the inhabitants of the earth and the word boat that is a combination of vessel, eight and people, shows the story of Genesis has been preserved in the Chinese culture. This history was to be reintroduced during the Tang Dynasty under its second emperor Taizong, who allowed missionaries from Persia into his country that enriched the Chinese culture, making it one of the most prosperous times in Chinese history. According to the London Guardian newspaper in 2010, Christianity first came into China via the Nestorians in the Tang Dynasty in the 7th century. This is how Emperor Taizong describes the Nestorians. The Wei has more than one name, and wise men have more than one method. Knowledge is such that it may suit all countries so that all creatures may be saved. The virtuous Alo Pen came from afar, bringing books to our capital. It is the salvation of living creatures, the riches of mankind, and it is right that this teaching should spread freely 
through the world. These are the words of the 7th century emperor concerning Nestorian Christianity. This artifact from the Tang Dynasty is inscribed with two languages, Chinese Mandarin and the Northern Semitic dialect Syriac Aramaic, the language of Jesus and formerly the language of the Neo-Syrian Empire and was once used throughout the Fertile Crescent. It was Sir Mark Aurel Stein, a Hungarian-British archaeologist known for his discoveries in Central Asia who resuscitated the Nestorians who were once almost lost in oblivion when he hooked up with a Taoist monk and abbot and keeper of the now famous Mongeo Caves, Wang Yuang Lu, and inside of that caves locked up for hundreds of years were thousands of manuscripts of Buddhist and Nestorian Christianity written in several different Eastern languages. And the French sinologist Paul Pelliot deciphered these ancient scripts and found a heavy Christian presence in the ancient Tang dynasty. The Diamond Sutra, a Buddhist manuscript now in London's British Library that was discovered in that cave is the earliest complete survival of a dated printed book and also in a British Library and discovered in that cave was a star map, the first known graphical representation of stars from ancient Chinese astronomy also dated to the Tang Dynasty. But in these caves was not only Nestorian manuscripts but a mural or painting of Nestorian Christians who were worshipping God freely in the peaceful reign of the Tang Dynasty. But there was an even more priceless artifact that was early discovered in China. When the Jesuits arrived in China, the Chinese Mandarins were more than eager to learn new knowledge from these Western intellectuals. They were not fully aware of the geopolitical strategy of the sons of Loyola. But these Jesuits thought that they were the first missionaries to come into China. Unbeknownst to the Jesuits at the time, they were preceded by the more primitive church of the East. They were nine centuries too late. And the Jesuits became aware of this when they found the famous Nestorian steel dated back to the Tang dynasty that was erected in 781 AD. It is written in nearly 1,900 inscribed Chinese characters and approximately 70 words and 70 personal names in Syriac. In the famous volume of works by English Assyriologist Sir Austin Henry Layard in the 19th century, this brilliant intellectual said that this celebrated inscription of Si Ganfu, which was seen by Jesuit missionaries in the year 1625, gives many particulars regarding the state of the Chaldean church in China from AD 620 to 781. But what was actually engraved on that stone, as it has now been deciphered and can be read into English? We shall look at just at an excerpt that has been documented by a 19th century French Catholic priest in his book Christianity in China, Tartary and Tibet. It reads, we worship seven times a day. But something is even more interesting, for it continues to say that on the seventh day, we offer sacrifice after having purified our hearts and received absolution for our sins. This religion, so perfect and so excellent, is difficult to name, but it enlightens darkness by its brilliant precepts. It is called the Luminous Religion. Why would a stone inscribed with the Nestorian faith specifically single out the seventh day as the highest time to worship God in their church service? That day is the seventh day creation Sabbath and we shall find out more in the rest of this study. Who exactly are the Nestorians? And why do so very few people know about them? They started in modern day Iraq, which has been titled the Cradle of Civilization, but are known as Ancient Babylon. And they spread throughout the East in Asia, and they are the oldest surviving church community in the world. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so does Marcus, my brother. 
This is where they are first mentioned in the Bible. And the English Assyriologist and archaeologist, the Right Honourable Sir Austin Henry Layard, has the best documented account of this church. He said that the doctrines of Christianity had early penetrated into the Assyrian provinces. When the Arabs invaded the territories of the Persian kings and spread their new faith over Asia, they found the Chaldean church already powerful in the east. If I have, he said, in these volumes, sometimes called the Chaldeans Nestorians, it is because that name has been generally given them. They have retained to a great extent and in all their purity the doctrines and forms of the primitive church. Why is their history so hidden? The Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge by Schaff Herzog and the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon tells us that the Catholic Church eventually converted nearly the whole nation to Catholicism and this is as a result of Timur, also known as Tamerlane, a Turco-Mongol conqueror who died in 1405 where he annihilated, killed and ransacked a good portion of that community in the east, leaving them very, very small in number, with hardly any trace of their history. Today their descendants are all Catholic now, and are being hunted down like animals and game by ISIS, and are almost being entirely wiped off the world map. But there was a time when ISIS and Timur's religious forebears totally depended upon them for knowledge. This huge carved head from the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the British Museum and this photo of a 19th century Nestorian Chaldean priest from Baghdad, Iraq, show that over thousands of years nothing has changed in complexion, facial features and the distinct wavy hairstyle. The Nestorians at one time had the most powerful culture in the East who were skilled in almost every trade and unlike the churches of today in the West, who are fragmented into thousands of sects, dwelling in numbers but still fighting each other on theological differences, these Christians spread all over the East in Asia and they brought their knowledge with them. The Syriac, Aramaic alphabet and language was to spread throughout the East and this language was to spread further than you can imagine. In Armenia, a Syriac Armenian steel was found in a back garden, showing that they went everywhere. In Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, they found a Nestorian stone inscribed with a cross and the Syriac Aramaic script. And the Sogdian script, a language used in Iran, is also derived from the Syriac Aramaic script. And the Uyghur alphabet, a Turkish people, is developed from the Sogdian and out of that alphabet came the Mongolian alphabet that was given to that nomadic tribe. The Mongolian alphabet was received from the Uyghurs, a Turkic people in the 13th century. The latter took it from the Sogdians, an Iranian people. The Sogdian alphabet was an adaptation of a Semitic alphabet, Aramaic. Genghis Khan, the Mongol ruler, had the largest empire in history covering a land mass that has never been surpassed. His descendants thrived after him and were all influenced in some way, shape or form by the Nestorians. Genghis Khan's fourth son, Tula Khan, was married to a Nestorian princess, Soga Gaktiani Beki, a Turk of the Karite peoples in Central Asia. They had a son together and his name was Hulagu Khan, and he also married a Karate Turkish Nasurian princess, Dokuz Khatun. They also produced a very high cultured Nasturian or Syriac Bible with their image on the front. Today, the descendants of the Mongolians still live the nomadic life as their forebears did over 800 years ago, and the predominantly Muslim Uyghurs also had Nasturians among them. But in a well-documented work, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon tells us how far these historians went. He said that under the reign of the Caliphs, 
the Nestorian church was diffused from China to Jerusalem and Cyprus. The Nestorians and Monophysites reject the spiritual supremacy of Rome. This church went everywhere in Asia and also impacted the Muslim world. Islamic architecture, especially its mosques, are marvellous engineering achievements. Its dome-like architecture could pass as an observatory, and its beautiful array of colours gives it an almost mesmerising appearance. But it was not original. It was all borrowed from cultures that already existed in the lands Muslims conquered. This is a mosque in Turkey with its four minarets. But when you pan across, it is modelled after an even older building in Turkey that has been the model for Islamic mosques and also precedes Islam. It is the great cathedral of Haggai Sophia that took five years, ten months and four days and was completed in 537 AD under the direction of two architects from Asia Minor where the ideas of longitudinal and centralised building were combined in a wholly original manner. In Syria, the early churches and their dome-like architecture dated to the 5th century AD, and the interior of these basilicas is where Islamic architecture borrowed its style from. And its neighbouring country, Iraq, its oldest or one of its oldest monasteries, dated to the 6th century AD is the famous St. Elijah Monastery with the dome-like architecture that was incorporated into Islamic architecture. But unfortunately, recent satellite imagery has confirmed that in December 2015, ISIS blew up this religious monument, leaving no trace of this early architecture that makes it even harder to authenticate the story in history. But as Edward Gibbons said, the Nestorians went into Cyprus, that is in southern Europe. And a Famagusta church in Cyprus, dated to 1350 AD, shows the dome-like architecture that was a trademark in Nestorian art. It can also be found in churches in Armenia, some that have preceded Islam and others that have succeeded Islam, where the interior looks like the interior of mosques in Spain and in Kazakhstan in Central Asia, Nestorian architecture is still visible in Tash Rabat, a building that looks like it is in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. Muhammad Alim Khan was one of the last surviving descendants of Genghis Khan. His mausoleum and the architecture in his native Uzbekistan shows the clear influence of Nestorianism on the Islamic culture. The Right Honourable Sir Austin Henry Layard said, The union of early Christian and Persian art and architecture produced a style too little known and studied. The architect or the traveller interested in the history of that graceful and highly original branch of art which attained its full perfection under the Arab rulers of Egypt and Spain should extend his journey to the remains of ancient Armenian cities far from high roads and mostly unexplored. He would then trace how that architecture, deriving its name from Byzantine, had taken the same development in the East as it did in the West and how its subsequent combination with the elaborate decoration, the varied outline and tasteful colouring of Persia had produced a style termed Saracenic, Arabic and Moresque. The 1001 Inventions is about Al Hazen, an Iraqi-born Arab scientist who lived in Egypt, where the Islamic world was given an opportunity of showing their contributions in the development of the modern world, especially in the field of science, and in a tense time of East versus West, that has dominated the 21st century. Men are not shy of defending Islamic science and its influence on the West. The beauty of Islam, when people were, you know, living in the Dark Ages, the Muslim civilization was the, you know, at the forefront of material development. 
you know, if people want to blame Islam for things, they, you know, they can blame us for inventing algebra or modern medical anesthesia. Daniel David Levering, the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author of The Golden Crucible, points out that there would be no Renaissance, there would be no Reformation in Europe without the role played by Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd and some of the great Muslim theologians, philosophers, scientists in bringing Greek text to Europe. Look at Is Islam a thousand years ago, Baghdad was the center of the intellectual, it was the intellectual capital of the world, while Europe, they were disemboweling heretics, okay? That's, where, that's why our numerals are called Arabic numerals, because they pioneered the use of these numerals and invented algebra, itself an Arabic word, an algorithm. Two-thirds of the stars in the night sky have Arabic names. How does that happen? Because they had navigating devices, astrolabes. That culture, of discovery ended and has not arisen since. These are Islamic astrolabes in museums all over the UK and different measuring devices and instruments from all over the Islamic world that does show the high technological achievement in the Islamic golden age. But there seems to be a big chunk of history missing. Where did Muslims get their Greek text from? Did they just pull it out from thin air? It is only fair that we quote from Islamic sources and see what they have to say. In a public research university in London, England, abbreviated as SOAS, but better known as the School of Oriental and African Studies, at the top floor of the library is a volume of books, the Encyclopedia of Islam, and in volume 3 it documents a man born in Iraq in the 9th century who has single-handedly had one of the greatest influence on the planet yet hardly anybody knows about him. Hunayn, born Ishaq al-Ibadi, the most important mediator of ancient Greek science to the Arabs. It was mainly due to reliable and clearly written translations of Hippocrates and Galen that the Arab physicians of the Middle Ages became worthy successors of the Greek. Hunayn was born in 192, that is according to the Islamic calendar, and 808, that is according to the Julian Gregorian calendar, in al Hira, where his father was a pharmacist. He was a descendant of the so-called Ibad, that is, Arab tribesmen, who had once embraced Christianity, and who, after the rise of Islam, remained faithful to the Syrian church, refusing to adopt the new religion. Under the Caliph, al mutawakil Hunayn was appointed chief physician to the court. Students from all over the world flood to the accredited academic institutions in the West for their higher learning and educational standards that will also guarantee them a job in high places where they will have the title of the ancient goddess behind their name, the alma mater. But how were these academic institutions able to function or were set up in the first place? At the top of 136 Gower Street in London, England, is a bust of Hippocrates, the Greek physician who has been titled as the father of Western medicine. In his famous oath, one of the oldest binding documents in history that is still held sacred by physicians, it says that no deadly medicine of a harmful or destructive nature should be administered to a patient. Natural remedies in use today is only a restoration of the ancient method of Hippocrates. And Galen, another Greek physician, founder of experimental physiology, was responsible for scholastic methods and scholastic philosophy, natural law of Stoic philosophy, who was a monotheist who mixed Stoicism and Christianity who, after Hippocrates, was the second most distinguished physician of antiquity. Panando Discorides had the leading text on pharmacology for 16 centuries via his treatise on the details of the properties of about 600 different medicinal plants and their dietetic and medicinal value that he documented in his famous De Materia Medica. And Euclid of Alexandria the Greek mathematician who has been titled as the father of geometry even though he was preceded by the Babylonians wrote 13 books 
titled Elements that gives a knowledge of mathematics and solids. And it was Hunayn ibn Ishaq in the 9th century who travelled to Syria, Palestine and Egypt collecting Greek manuscripts of these and other Greek scholars and translated them into Syriac for Christians and Arabic for Muslims. This is how contemporary Muslim scholars describe him. Hunayn ibn Ishaq, also Hunayn or Hunayn, was a famous and influential Assyrian Nestorian Christian scholar, physician and scientist. He studied Greek and became known among the Arabs as the Sheik of the translators. Hunayn translated writings on agriculture, stones and religion. He translated some of Plato's and Aristotle's works and the commentaries of ancient Greeks. In time, Hunayn ibn Ishaq became arguably the chief translator of the era and laid the foundations of Islamic science. These are the words of Islamic scholars. Look at the human eye. Studying it in detail has been titled ophthalmia or ophthalmic that comes from the Greek root word op, see or optic. When people go to the opticians to get their eyes checked, where did the actual study of lenses come from? Moorfields Eye Hospital in North London in England is the oldest and largest centre for ophthalmic treatment, teaching and research in Europe. There are also museums in the UK that specialises in the history and the development of optics and the study of the human eye, some in London, England and others in Glasgow in Scotland that has detailed eyeballs outside of its sockets in a jar. Johannes or John Kepler, a contemporary of Italian scientist Galileo Galilei, was a German mathematician, astronomer and astrologer who laid the foundations of modern dynamical astronomy. He produced one of the oldest and details diagrams of the human eye in the Reformation era of Europe. But he was preceded by a number of centuries by Al Hazen, the Egyptian based Iraqi born Arab mathematician who has been titled the Second Ptolemy. And this is what helped Islamic physicians to do successful operations on the human eye when conducting experiments in the field of ophthalmology. But Al Hazen was preceded by the famous Nestorian in one of the hardest books to obtain. The Book of the Ten Treaties on the Eye by Hunayn ibn Ishaq. On the inside of the book it reads, In the name of God the Compassionate, the Merciful. Because true science gives God the glory, false science gives man the glory. And this is the oldest diagram of the human eye in the world. And it was by Hunayn ibn Ishaq, the Nestorian Christian, that he himself said he got from Hippocrates, and through a very in-depth study of the human brain and its connection to the human eye, Hunayn ibn Ishaq said, Now the eye is both a sensory organ and therefore it is controlled by two nerves from the brain. So today when we have our eyes checked to test our vision by the opticians, or if we have to undergo an operation or a laser scan, if there is any damage done to one of the most important parts of our body, credit should be given to the Nestorian chronicler who named Ubun Ishak. But that is not it. It doesn't just stop there. There are hospitals all over the world, and many of them are highly credited for their medical expertise and life-saving operations. It must be quite stressful when you have another human's life in your hands, and one false move can remove another human being off the earth. But how did hospitals develop? On the official website of London Science Museum, it gives a history of hospitals beginning in 4000 BC. As you scroll through, it mentions European hospitals, Islamic hospitals, but no mention of the Nestorian Christians of the East. In the Islamic Golden Age, they achieved some powerful breakthroughs in the field of medicine, 
but Muslim scholars bravely tell us who actually taught them. The Nestorians and their school and hospital were treated with great respect by the Muslim conquerors. Describing the school and hospital in Jundi Shapar, the Arab historian Ibn al-Kifti had this to say. They, the physicians, made rapid progress in the science, developed new methods in the treatment of disease along pharmacological lines to the point that their therapy was judged superior to that of the Greek and Hindus. Furthermore, these physicians adopted the scientific methods of other people and modified them by their own discoveries. They elaborated medical laws and recorded the work that had been developed. During several centuries, the school and hospital, or the Bimaratista, as it was called in Persia, held first place in the world of medicine and science. It was from among their students that Persia, Iraq and Syria recruited their physicians. But the Muslims were not the only ones to benefit from the Nestorian physicians. The whole of the East gained from their medical expertise. And Kublai Khan, the 13th century Mongol ruler and grandson of Genghis Khan, who entertained Marco Polo in his kingdom, knew how beneficial the Nestorian physicians were to his empire. In a work written by two Nestorians of Uyghur origin in China in the 13th century, titled The Monks of Kublai Khan, translated from Syriac into English by Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge, the keeper of the Assyrian and Egyptian antiquities in the British Museum, it reads that Kublai Khan was especially anxious to attract Christians, example the Nestorians, to his country where he found their medical learning and great business capacity of much benefit to his subjects. The Chinese, Mongols, Tartars, Turks, Persians, Armenians and the peoples of the Euphrates Valley and Arabia all would appreciate the superior mental faculties of the Nestorian missionaries and traders and their great physical energy and above all their knowledge of medicine and their practical treatment of the diseases of the body and the healings they affected. When we look at the modern world, do we ever ask how it developed into what it is today? Tape recorders and Walkman are now relics of the past that are replaced by the instantaneous communicators of digital technology. But their development all had a beginning. And when we look at the education system in the West and the medical industry and the ancient cultures of China and Islam, the Nestorians, these Bible-believing Christians from the East, have been completely deleted from the annals of mankind when many Western intellectuals knew the contributions they made and logged them in their own personal journals. When Marco Polo, the Italian explorer, toured the East, he mentioned the Nestorians in his famous volume of works. He said that Yachi, a very great and noble city in which are numerous merchants and craftsmen, the people are of sundry kinds, for they are not only Saracens and idolaters, but also a few Nestorian Christians. The German church historian John Laurent von Moschim said, The Nestorians, who are called Chaldeans, preside principally in Mesopotamia and the adjacent countries. English historian Edward Gibbon says, The Nestorians, who, under the name of Chaldeans or Assyrians, are confounded with the most learned and most powerful nation of Eastern antiquity. Prolific writer and Scotsman J. A. Wiley said, We find in the very heart of the Mohammedan Empire a small Christian society, the Chaldeans of the Kurdish mountains. The Right Honourable Sir Austin Henry Layard said that we are indebted to the Chaldeans for the preservation of numerous precious fragments of Greek learning, as the Greeks were many centuries before to the ancestors of the Chaldeans for the records of astronomy and the elements of Eastern science. The Chaldeans, or Babylonians, though pagan, were very skilled in mathematics, 
and we still use their methods of counting till this very day. Some of the earliest mathematical triangles were later adopted 1,500 years by the Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. The triangles accredited to him are Babylonian. Plato, who is known as the father of Western philosophy, incorporated many of Pythagoras' ideas into his school of thinking, especially his Babylonian mathematics. And Plato's pupil Aristotle continued the school of thought from his teacher. And their writings were preserved and translated by Hunayn ibn Ishaq. He transferred them to his Muslim contemporaries, who then shared these writings with medieval Europe. Isabel and Ferdinand of Spain defeated the Moors in 1492 and rooted out all Islamic rule from the Iberian Peninsula. But these North African Moors reintroduced Greek texts and literature back into Europe that they got from the Nestorians that gave birth to the Renaissance, a word that means rebirth or born again, a revival of ancient Greek literature that led to the rise of Italian genius Leonardo. Da Vinci, who has so many titles and first, but he specialized also in optics. This painting by 17th century German astronomer Johann Hevelius shows Al Hazen on the left and Galileo on the right when analyzing the history of optics. Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei has been titled as the father of modern physics and the father of science who did many experiments to improve on our understanding of the Earth and the planets. English mathematician, scientist and genius Sir Isaac Newton built upon and expanded upon the ideas of Galileo's works. That is why he said he stands upon the shoulders of giants with his knowledge of optics that was a more enhanced look at it through experimental knowledge and science. And German-born scientist Albert Einstein expanded upon Newton's ideas and has greatly influenced modern physics via his many experiments that modern science is now confirming in pinpoint accuracy. But these great names would be nothing more than dry ink in archival registers, virtual nobodies if it wasn't for the foundation laid by the Nestorian Chaldean Assyrian Christians. But what did they believe that singled them out and made them different from the Christians of today. The Swiss-American church historian Philip Schaff said that the Kurdish Nestorians are characterized by a pronounced Judaic Christianity which is also apparent in their rituals. The Nestorians eat no pork. They believe in neither auricular confession nor purgatory and permit their priests to marry. What is Judaic Christianity, or others have named them Judaizers? According to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 26, it reads that but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So Jerusalem, not Rome, is the mother of all the churches. And when Paul was addressing the Gentile Greek community in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, he said that for ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So the early apostolic church was modeled on the Judaic or Judean pattern. And any Christian labeled a Judaizer is closer to apostolic Christianity than the so-called modern-day mainstream Christianity. The Right Honourable Sir Otto Henry Layard is one of the fathers of the archaeological science called Assyriology, when he wrote about the Nestorian Chaldean Assyrians. This wasn't data he collated from books, but he spent quality time with them in Iraq and obtained first-hand knowledge of their culture, church, history and biblical faith. Ebed Jesus, a Chaldean who wrote in the 14th century, asserts that the Orientals have not changed the truth, but as they received it from the Apostles, so have they retained it without variation. 
The profession of faith adopted by the fathers of their church and still repeated twice a day by the Chaldeans differs in few respects from the Nicene Creed. On Wikipedia, the churches that follow the Nicene Creed are Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox and most Protestant churches. So how did the Nestorian belief differ than mainstream churches of today? It reads, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of all things which are visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of his Father before all worlds, who was not created, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of his Father, and is again to come and judge the living and the dead. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. The refusal of the title of Mother of God to the Virgin, which the Chaldeans still reject. But Layard noticed something peculiar about their faith. He said that on the Sabbath, no Chaldean performs a journey or does any work. Layard was preceded by a missionary who wrote a book in 1841 claiming that the Nestorians are one of the lost tribes and guess why? The narrator Asahel Grant said, On the plain there is much desecration of the Lord's day, but can the execution of the Mosaic ritual regarding the Sabbath by the independent Nestorians be accounted for in any other way than as a remnant of Judaism? Because they kept the biblical creation Sabbath, they were mistaken as one of the lost tribes of Israel. Interesting. When analyzing the Nestorians, the narrator has observed the striking similarities with his own faith, such as the belief in the second coming of Christ, the first resurrection and eternal life. Abstinence from pork like the Ethiopian church also. One baptism by immersion totally rejecting the spiritual supremacy of Rome and the belief in the seventh-day creation Sabbath. What is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a time when the body unwinds and benefits from physical rest. The mind should also unwind and get physical rest where it should be a time to reflect and have full communion with God. It is the best and most convenient time for the family to come together and share their pains and their joys and their frustration with each other. If you are a single parent, you should also spend quality time with your children so they can receive the love they deserve without looking for it on the streets. It should also be a time spent in deep prayer and in nature, either on your own or with friends or family where you can have a deeper appreciation of what God has created in the six days. The Sabbath was first introduced in the beginning of time at creation. In Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, it reads that thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The Anglo-Saxon word rested is a translation of the Hebrew word Shabbat, and it was first introduced at creation, so that mankind can never forget who put everything in place. It was revived at Sinai in Arabia in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, when God said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven, and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. 
wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What did Jesus think about the Sabbath? The Lord must have had something to say. Well, let's see. In Luke chapter 4 verses 14 and 16, it reads that, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit in Galilee. And there went out the fame of him through all the region round about. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So Jesus kept the Sabbath. There are many Christians who teach that the Sabbath was made for Jews. But what does Jesus say in Mark chapter 2 verses 27 and 28? And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for who? Jews? No, man. And not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The Northern European word Lord is a translation of the Greek word curious that means master, controller and supreme in authority. So Jesus is the supreme master over the Sabbath. That is deep. When the disciples asked him about the signs of his coming in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus warned them about deception and it described the spiritual condition of this planet and how it will spiral out of control just prior to his second coming. But there was something distinct Jesus said about last day's persecution. He said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20 that what pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So we have seen on the continent of Europe, in Scotland and Ireland, men in obedience to Christ and his example kept the seventh day creation Sabbath. We have looked on the African continent in Ethiopia. They also kept the seventh day creation Sabbath. We have seen on the continent of Asia, the Nestorian church and like Christ and the apostles as their example, kept the seventh day creation Sabbath. But some of these churches no longer exist and the ones that do no longer practice it. So God is making one final last call. He said, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. What does Jesus want every inhabitant on the earth to know that would include the everlasting gospel. It is the last Sabbath truth. Saying not with a quiet voice, but with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Then the Sabbath is introduced and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation chapter 14 verses six and seven. This is going to cause quite an agitation, for many will struggle between the traditions of men and the word of God. And this is what most Christians will struggle with. For French Bishop Monsignor Louis Gaston de Sigo was a popular Catholic apologetic. He wrote a book two centuries ago titled Plain Talk About the Protestants of Today. And a portion of it says that it is worth its while to remember that this observance of the Sabbath, in which, after all, the only protestant worship consists, not only has no foundation in the Bible, but it is in flagrant contradiction with its letter, which commands rest on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. It was the Catholic Church which, by the authority of Jesus Christ, has transferred this rest to the Sunday in remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. Thus the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the church. Very powerful statement. We shall find out more about the Seventh Day Creation Sabbath in a study titled Lost in Time. Feel free to subscribe to the Even at the Doors YouTube channel where you'll receive regular videos. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter by clicking on the links below.
I would just like to thank all those who have sent donations that have kept this ministry afloat. And if you would like to continue to support this work, also click on the link below. If you would like to see this work spread even further, you have permission to distribute this video for non-commercial or commercial use on the condition that you do not add or take away from the content of this study. Thank you.